all. This session is entitled The World of Work, Preparing for the Rise of the Robots. For those of you who came to the last session, you'll remember that my name is Scylla Ross. I'm principal of the Cooperative College and I'm facilitating this session. Um, and I wanted to begin by welcome you, welcoming you all and handing straight over to the person who is the chair of the Centenary Commission, Dame Helen Ghosh, to welcome you and to frame today's discussion. So Helen, if I could hand over to you, welcome. Certainly, thank you very much, Scylla. And it's just fabulous to see so many people um, involved in today's webinar. After I think what was a first session a week ago that was equally popular and immensely inspirational, and I'm sure today's will be as well. Um, we were just saying, as we were waiting for, for the session to open, how very different the situation is today than it was when we wrote our commission report, and certainly when they wrote their commission report in 1919. Um, both they and we, uh, in our report published last November, um, yes, we highlighted uh, the importance of adult education and lifelong learning for vocational skills, uh, and that's what we are going to be talking about uh, very much today. But we, and in 1919, framed it in a much bigger picture. We said that adult education and lifelong learning isn't just about skills for work, um, although in 1919 and today, or at least when we wrote, wrote our report, we were very much thinking of changes in the workplace, mechanization in 1919, the, the rise of the factory, um, and in 2019, the impact of AI and machine learning uh, on so many jobs. But we put it in the bigger picture that actually adult education and lifelong learning was about giving people a wealth of skills from basic literacy, numeracy, and as we were discussing last week, vital digital skills through to uh, skills of critical thinking, uh, of uh, um, uh, the understanding about how to learn about the much bigger world that would enrich people's lives at every stage in their lives um, and uh, enable them as citizens to play a full part in society, which was uh, the aim uh, we felt, and as in 19 of what, uh, 1919, of what adult education and lifelong learning was about. Here we are in um, April 2020, and we see a much more uncertain world. Certainly, I feel all the issues that we identified of training people to be flexible, to work as teams, to adapt to change, uh, all of those things, I think, are still, still absolutely vital in thinking about whatever future faces us as we come out of the COVID-19 uh, emergency. But I think, too, um, the recognition that is increasing that there are so many workers whose contributions to society we have all undervalued for so many years, who now are supporting society in an absolutely vital way. Uh, the caring professions, the health professions, the people who just keep society ticking over. And I do hope that in today's session we'll also explore how how um, their contribution uh, may be supported through adult education and lifelong learning and how we can enrich our picture of the world of work and the role that adult education and lifelong learning can play as we go through our debates. So it's a wonderful opportunity uh, to be talking about these issues and as I said last week there could be no better time than today to be talking about the issues that we will be hearing about from Karen Billamoria and from Roger shortly. Thank you very much indeed, Helen. That's a, a marvellous sort of teeing up of our discussion today. What we'll do is follow the same formula we used last week, where we will ask our two guest speakers, who I'm del delighted to welcome, and I'll get back to in a second, to spend about five minutes each uh, talking about some elements, some aspect, uh, of, their, of, of their response to the world of work, preparing for the rise of the robots and, and how we might respond to that. And then we'll go into groups 
uh, and I'll, we'll say a little bit more about that later and have a discussion around a, a key question and then come back. But it gives me great pleasure to begin uh, by introducing our two speakers. Uh, first is Lord Karen Billimora, who is a commissioner uh, and uh, is also president-elect of the Co Confederation of British Industry. And second, Roger McKenzie, also a commissioner and assistant general secretary of UNISM, two immensely expert uh, guests who are absolutely delighted to welcome. And if I could begin by asking Karen if he would like uh, to spend about five minutes um, telling us a little bit about a question or responding to one of the questions I'd, I'd like to put to him, which is fundamentally how he thinks that we as employers or community groups or universities or others and others could collaborate um, to create a much richer lifelong learning provision than anyone could do standing alone. How, how can we do that to, to meet this great challenge that we are confronted with uh, in the future? So if I could ask for five minutes of your time, that would be wonderful. I'm just trying to see you on the the huge array of people. Hello, Thank Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be with, with all of you at this uh, completely surreal and extremely challenging time globally for all of us. Uh, I think that having released our report, um, the Centenary Adult Education Commission, and the, the amazing work that I was privileged to, to, to help out with with my fellow commissioners, um, couldn't have been more timely uh, in, in terms of the challenges that we're facing today. And, and I was looking at the report uh, this, this, this week, in fact, before, before this call, and wow, I mean, I'm, I, I, I look back at it and I'm so proud of what we did. It was so relevant, so pertinent, and then the whole aspect of innovation, of creativity. And here we are seeing as a country in the UK, how adaptable can we get? And I always say the true test of leadership is not in the good times, but in the bad times. And, and this is when you can test whether a country can A, come together, but how adaptable, how flexible can we be? And I think looking back on history, this has been one of our greatest strengths as a country is the ability to be adaptable and innovative and creative. And there's a whole section in our report about innovation and, and creativity. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was talking to my older son who um, was, is reading a book uh, about the history of trade. And, and we were just discussing and he said, look at the way the world has continually um, innovated and things have been disintermediated continually, whether it's the industrial revolution, whether it's ships from going from faster ships to clippers, to steamships, to constant disintermediation taking place. So the constant need for us to adapt to a new environment. And every time it said, oh, well, we'll never be able to do it. People are gonna lose their jobs uh, and people are gonna get left behind. And yes, temporarily, some people may get left behind, but the more adaptable we can be uh, to take, take advantage of these changes, the better. And so here we are doing what we're doing now on this, on this call, uh, when earlier we'd have got together at a conference or around the table, uh, whereas now we're doing this because we have to do it. And, and in future, much more of this is going to take place. In, in terms of, of robotics and disintermediation, again, in, in my industry, uh, where we're producing beer, uh, at the moment, wearing my Cobra beer hat, our restaurants, we supply over 6,000 restaurants, they are shut. So my business, the majority of my business, goes through the restaurants, two-thirds of it. I have no business. It's a complete standstill. On the other hand, my supermarkets are supplied through the brewery. Now, our brewery is not functioning fully because a lot of workers have to, for safety reasons, um, not work. There's social distancing and safety distancing in the brewery. So even where we can produce the supermarkets, we can't produce as much as we'd like to, but we're making the most of what we can. So you, you just have to adapt and, and go with it as much as you can. Harvard Business School, for example, where universities are concerned, universities are adapting. I, one of my roles, I chair the, the Cambridge Judge Business School and looking ahead with our plans, um, how are we going to be delivering the programs that we deliver? Today, a lot of it at Cambridge or at Oxford, 
we love the undergraduate supervision system. And I really don't think you can replicate that. I think that needs to be face to face and it's wonderful and it's unique. And anyone who's been a part of it, it's a privilege to have been a part of it. But with other courses concerned, MBAs now, you have so many MBAs that are executive MBAs, which are part-time. And um, I'm a fellow at Kellogg College, which is headed by, by Jonathan, who's on the call. And Kellogg in numbers is now the largest college at Oxford. And 80% of our students are, are part-time and it's postgraduate only. And, and, but they have to come and spend some time at, at Oxford, which I think is important. Uh, but can we get to the stage where courses are completely remote? Uh, and I think that my personal view is, yes, there will be some courses that can be remote. Harvard Business School at the moment, which I've studied executive education, is offering Harvard are offering pure online courses right now to the whole world free of charge. And I'm getting messages from people all over uh, the world saying, oh, I've just signed up for a Harvard course. This is fantastic. This is great. And it's absolutely free. This is world-class learning free, free, the whole world. I mean, that is just staggering um, what is taking place. So I think the possibilities with what we're going through is, is ab absolutely um, stunning. And then I just want to link this to one more aspect before I conclude, and that is into well-being. Uh, I took part in a debate in the House of Lords before uh, we, well, we, we stopped, basically. And it was a, a debate on well-being and on mindfulness and on happiness. And Lord Laird, one of my colleagues who's, who's a, a world guru on, on happiness, I was speaking in the debate. He started Action for Happiness. And I think this is another aspect of it is can we, looking ahead, go into a world of increased automation, but actually increased um, communication between all of us um, in a way that we're well-being in mind, mindfulness in mind. And the country Bhutan, which I've been privileged to, to believe, uh, to, to visit, uh, they, they measure not just their GDP, but they measure their gross national happiness uh, as well. And I think it's very important. My father was a senior general and he always said, son, there's no point. He was in charge of 350,000 troops when he was in charge of Central Army in India. No point having an efficient team, you've got to have a happy uh, and an efficient team. Uh, and I conclude with this, I think my five minutes are, are up, are they up now? So I conclude with, um, I received an email from the former head of the London Business School, Professor John Quelch, who then later taught me uh, how, please forgive my dogs barking in the background. Um, and uh, he taught me the Harvard Business School as well. And he's just written his seven C's of leadership in a time of crisis. And the seven C's are calm, confidence, communicate, collaborate, community, compassion, and cash. Without cash, we can't survive. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Karen. Uh, very thought provoking. And uh, thank you so much for that. Um, Roger, I'm delighted to welcome you for your five minutes and you, I understand, are going to reflect on how we can make educational opportunities available in the workplace and in communities so that it's available when it's most needed. Uh, and that includes when facing new technological challenges at work or indeed uh, af after redundancy, when people have been made redundant through new technology. So thank you, Roger. No, thank, thank you. And um, thank, thanks for the opportunity to, to take part. Um, I'm, I'm actually still kind of reeling and intrigued from the, the notion of um, a world guru on happiness. Or, 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 I mean, I just think that's a, a real thing. I'm thinking that we ought to unionize those people, really. So um, I think there'll be some union and um, unison people approaching those um, gurus on happiness because there's lots of our members at the minute who are not very happy who are being put in harm's way frankly um, and um, the, the last thing they're thinking about at the minute is is about learning opportunities they're just thinking about survival a lot of these people um, because frankly they haven't got I have to say this right they haven't got personal protective um, equipment and they're being put in harm's way and um, what they're thinking about at the minute is, are they going to see um, their families again um, at the end of the day? We've got lots of our members who are being told that they have to um, sleep in in care homes at the moment. And they're not very happy 
and about the situation that, that they face. Um, I could go on for a long time about that, but I won't. Um, I, I, I wanted to just reflect back a minute to something that, that Helen said right at the beginning. So I, 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 th I thought that was, um, it was really important in terms of what we value um, in the workplace and what we value as a skill, because it wasn't so very many um, few weeks ago where the whole notion of care work was being deliberately not seen as being a skill, but now it is. So it just shows how quickly things change. And that raised, raised for me lots of issues about, well, if things change so quickly in terms of what we now regard as, as an essential task in society or an essential skill that two weeks ago we didn't see as an essential skill, how do you actually go about planning for something like that? Um, I think there needs to be a kind of re-evaluation of what we actually mean by skill. Um, what we value um, as a society and I, I hope that that's one of the things that comes out of this um, kind of in many ways really really tragic circumstances that we find ourselves at the minute. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, about the sort of learning that, um, that we're trying to um, promote. Um, there's a number of different aspects to this. One of the first and most important is something that we still actually get funding from government to do one of the C's um, that, that Karen was talking about um, which is um, in terms of workplace learning um, so we get money from the un for the um, union learning fund from government they've just renewed that again um, for us so we, we're going to have at least another year of the union learning fund the great thing about the union learning fund I, I think in terms of this discussion um, is that it, it enables um, learning to take place in workplaces. It enables people who for many years, like me actually, who were told for many many years that you know your contribution in the classroom isn't re really worth very much, that you, you, you know you're kind of not the same sort of skill level as everybody else or learning level as everybody else, but actually what it does, it puts, it gets peer um, kind of learning taking place in the workplace. So you get people as union learning reps who are supporting other learners within the workplace. I think that's been proven to be extremely valuable um, for many, many workplaces across the country. Now, where we can get those sort of agreements for those union learning um, um, fund um, uh, kind of um, training sessions to take place, then that's great. They're off, they are often in a lot of the big workplaces that, that we're organising. So, I mean, we've got something like 40,000 employers where we've got members, um, with the biggest union in the country, something like 40,000 employers. We've got something like 150,000 workplaces where we've got members. These are huge numbers, and I've not included in that um, because they are workers as well, people who go into other people's homes and deliver a care service for them or going to a care home right so they're not included in those figures these are huge huge numbers so i think part of the challenge that we face is that is to make sure that it's a these are opportunities that everybody gets access to and not just the few so you can't just get access, you shouldn't just be able to get access to these sort of learning opportunities because you happen to be in a well-organized workplace and um, you should also be able to get these opportunities because actually we value the skills that people have and need to develop and therefore every employer needs to be taking part in this um, in providing learning opportunities um, whether funded through the union learning fund or not because the fact is we still see lots of um, employers and lots of those 40,000 employers where we're not recognized anyway for for bargaining with those employers who um, actually what we're seeing in these particular segments are treating people really really badly so the thought of them suddenly turning around and treating people really well and giving them learning opportunities is a bit far-fetched at the minute frankly um, so we've we've got a we've got a dialogue and I, I think one of the great things that we've done with the with the um, commission's work just enormously proud um, to be part of on behalf of, um, of, of Unison is that we put that debate back on the agenda again about what what are we actually talking about in terms of skills 
what is adult further higher education actually for? What are the links between all of these um, important facets of adult education? Um, and I think that's the, the big thing that we've done. Now, we didn't know we were doing that at the time and that we were going to have these circumstances, obviously. Um, but, but what we've got to do now, I think, is continue that discussion because I think now it's more and more important now than it's ever been. I just want to say something really quickly um, in, in my one minute about um, some of the other learning opportunities because of course it's about learning in the workplace but it's also about using some of the institutions that have been um, decimated in terms of their funding over the last few years like further and higher education institutions um, and we've got to get the debate about the worth of those organizations back on the agenda again not just for vocational learning as important as that is but just for learning's sake and, and that might seem like a really kind of old-fashioned argument to get into, but I, I really genuinely believe that. As somebody who was a product of people taking um, the, the, the opportunity to let me sit in a, a room with people who had a similar experience as me and being able to exchange ideas with those people when for years I was told that my contribution was worthless and yet I'll go and sit in a classroom like thousands and thousands of workers do through the trade union education system through the union learning program and find out actually you know what maybe we do actually know something, maybe we have got a contribution to make, and it starts them on the road to further learning, and that cannot be um, underestimated at all. So I just wanted to, to make those points. I hope those are helpful in the discussion. Thank you so much, Roger, and I think you've really put your finger on it. Never has a discussion of skill been resonated so much as we understand the people who are really doing the important things in many cases in our society but of course the commissioners the early commissioners from the 1919 report shared that view they had a belief that working people uh, would enjoy benefit create around some of those areas of learning that of course had hitherto uh, been denied to them so you know that 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 tradition is something we are building on and thank you both very much indeed for those contributions would anyone like to kick off? I, I, I just thought Roger was fabulous when he said, how do we revalue what we mean by skill? Um, you know, what is a skill? And I think Karen touched on that as well in terms of flexibility and innovation, but, but thoughts on how we progress this agenda in an unknowable future. Marilyn, hello. You need to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yep. Uh, going on from Lord Billamoria, he raised a key issue, in my mind anyway, though not necessarily vocalising it. I come from a long line of people that have run businesses. And one of the things that I've encountered in a long up and down career is the total ignorance of employers who do not recognize, and this has got nothing to do with a political agenda, but just do not recognize the value of sweat capital in their business. Yes, they can sit behind a desk and think of an idea but the real value of that business as it moves forward are the skill sets and the ability to achieve high productivity of the employees. And other than there is an alteration generally in the mentality of employers, uh, we're always going to be up against this problem because there are more employees than there are employers forget the various economic models of business but until employers of all natures recognize that their people are the most valuable asset that they have we will always be up against this wall of ignorance 
and we'll all suffer accordingly. I mean, it has been pointed out now that all of a sudden, miraculously, our care sector has been recognised as a highly skilled profession. Yes, it's unfashionable and has been lowly paid disproportionate to its community value. Yeah. You know, what the hell? During World War II, Dame Helen, our miners and steel workers were the most valuable people in the community because they made our munitions. Now, that is not necessarily that fashionable. So it's a major education, ironically, of the employers that is needed. They've got to change their mindset. I mean, I'm just generalizing. Of course, yeah. in Lemuria, there are several very, very good employers that actually practice this philosophy but the majority don't why why great answer who's got the answer to that question bob you need to unmute i thought i have yeah uh, perhaps we ought to concentrate to some extent on educating employers. I, I used to work for ICI and we used to say for uh, every pair of hands came a free brain and um, ICI did used to, uh, back in the old days ICI, used to appreciate the, the fact that uh, just because you were a, a manual worker didn't mean to say you didn't have a brain. Um, and perhaps we could spend our time thinking about should we not concentrate on educating employers which would then mean that they would educate their manual workers. Mm. Mm. The, I think what was very interesting in the course of the work that the Commission did, and it was good to have comment, comments on this, is it, it will undoubtedly be the case that despite everything we've learned in the last few months, but, but before that, there are some jobs which are, in a sense, better done by robots, or at least don't need to be done by people. Yeah, and I think what's so fascinating about the current situation is that people are recognizing that there are some jobs that can never be done by robots, and indeed they would rather they were done by real people. Uh, it's rather, <coughs> I tend to have a prejudice to go in, in the supermarket queue, go to the queue with a real person, rather than, than the automatic till machines where I don't have to meet anybody at all. Mm. So that issue about what are the jobs in our unknowable future work, where we want as a society people to be involved and care must be one of those but there must be others that it, it's not just for employers to define it it's also for people to define what they want their world to look like hi jenny hello can everyone hear me yep um, i'm jenny Hoy. i'm um, head of the center for open learning at edinburgh university it's nice to meet you all um, lovely and to meet you yeah, thank you. It's, it strikes me with these conversations that they, they're really helpful and they appear perennially. <laughs> we can rely on having these same conversations year after year. Um, in, a, in a role like mine, I'm, I'm always struck by what's the evidence of need. And so for me, I can have as many questions as I like about fixing this. We'll come back to what are my resources? Who are my people? What can we afford to do? Where are our priorities? And that's a, I assume, a, a common thread throughout all of the providers and, and, and I'm sure will resonate with everyone listening. So for me, it's how do I know what the problem is that I'm trying to fix? And that's not yeah. very putting it, but what, what's the evidence that I can grapple with and then apply an infrastructure and a, a plan to... Um, I don't have that information and it will come to me via individuals and so you're reliant on having friends in the right places which is 
inclusive and um, not a very representative way of working. Um, but it would be really interesting to hear from colleagues about how, you know, if they have good examples of how this has worked in their organisations or in their careers or their friendships, whatever it is, um, how, how has the project been started? How have we got it off the ground? Because that's the bit that I struggle with. I know this is a good thing. I have the resources of the university behind me. I can make a case, but I need the evidence I need to do that. And that's where I stumble. And, and the project you want to get off the ground precisely, Jenny, is just to understand what problem you're trying to solve. In Edinburgh, we have the, the City Deal project, which colleagues might be aware of. We have a great deal of money to try and address the need, you know, the, um, the, the robot age, you know, people being um, de-skilled, for example, being replaced. Yeah, I've got a cat that's due any minute. It doesn't bark, but... Uh. There's an enormous amount of money available and, and we'll try and do something with it, but it's, it's all to do with data and the effect sleep is having on our lives, both in terms of um, home and working life. So we're trying to come up with solutions to that, and I'm sure we'll, we'll have plenty when we come back to um, the project meetings in the coming months. But I'm still struck by, I'm sitting here with lots and lots of money in a privileged position. How do I, how do I give that money to people and then have, using data, using, I mean, it's, uh, back to front situation because it's a data driven project, but lifelong learning centers tend to sit across many, many different units in the university. They could sit within student recruitment and admissions. They could sit within continuing education. Some like ours sit with foundation programs. So even just in terms of institutional infrastructure and flow of yeah. there are interruptions there to the, the types of conversations that you can be involved in. And that's just something that I'm reflecting on as I'm yeah. asking about this. And how do we take all that great money and the great energy behind a project? And then from that comes the ideas, whereas I'm used to the ideas coming first and then well, the money yes. following. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But underlying your point is, what do we already know about what the future of work is likely to look like? And what do yeah. we know or what could we guess current events are going to change that. Does, do people have views on that? Joseph, you look as though you were wanting to come in. <clears throat> Hi, I've only, got our, I've only got your initial, I don't know what your name is. Oh, it's, it's Richard, sorry. Richard. Hi, Richard. Hello there. Um, yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd sort of share my experience of, uh, of, of sort of robotics and you, you said earlier you know, that some companies kind of fear them. Um, my background is I'm a manufacturing engineer. Um, I'm also a member of um, Kellogg College. And we manufacture precision sort of prismatic and turn components. We use a lot of the latest sort of high-tech machinery to do that. And as you can imagine, we're incredibly busy at the moment making bits of ventilators and things yeah. like that, like right, the sort of COVID-19 virus. Um, we've recently been putting in over the last two years um, collaborative robotics um, that actually will load and unload uh, our machine tools and we were obviously concerned how the workforce is going to take this. We've got a workforce of about 150 odd people um, and actually sitting down with them and explaining what we were doing with the robots, why we were bringing the robots in. Um, they have actually been incredibly well received. It's enabled us to um, take some of the more laborious jobs, the operator jobs, uh, away from the operators. We've uh, reskilled them, retrained them. Their experiences of loading the machines and the kind of jigs and fixtures that are required to hold the components has been very creative, they've been very uh, innovative in helping design some of the robotic manipulators that load the machines so from my own personal experience actually starting to work you know more with sort of robotics in our field has been incredibly positive and has enabled a whole set of reskilling and for a lot of our staff to find real value in what they do and 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 to and to contribute so it's not just 
the techie guys writing the programs, the yeah. robot, five axis machines. It's everyone coming together as a creative community to actually make that robotized cell so much better, so much slicker. And that's just, just my experience. And in terms of the, the learning that the people who've made those creative contributions needed, did you have to add to that or did it just, as it were, emerge from them naturally? Did it Sorry, you, you broke training issues or not? Sorry, you broke up. Did you say training? Yeah. Did, did you have to do anything to, to get them to release that kind of creativity or did they just respond spontaneously? No, they responded sort of spontaneously. I'm fairly lucky. I think I understand the staff very, very well. I make it my business to do so. I encourage them to come forward. Um, I encourage you know, creativity and good ideas. Um, it was very much spontaneous. I, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of our, well, all of our staff, they come to work to do a good job. And if they can feel as if they can contribute yeah. to the, the overall effort, the team effort, um, then they're very, very happy to do so. It wasn't, we weren't having to push them for this level of innovation. It was, it was freely given. Yeah, yeah. So that sounds like part of the issue in terms of telling a story is to, to, to tell positive stories, that, that this can work and that people can play a part. And it isn't, a, it isn't just a threat. It isn't a threat. It's also an opportunity. Yeah. And, and, and be genuine, honest, and be truthful. Yeah. You know, the workforce will deal with the truth. Yeah. Um, don't shy away from it. Yeah. Other thoughts? Karen, did you want to come in on the point that will be made? Hello, if I may, if you just five minutes before you're winding up, I'll just say I don't I would rather other people who haven't had a say have a say. Have and a say I'll first. Just make yeah. a couple of points right at the end, if I may. Lovely. Yeah, we, we get good warning as to when we're five minutes from the end. Thank you. Great. Anyone else? Where's Lily? I've just got somebody with the initials HL, and I don't know who they may be, but other, do other people have thoughts, Joseph? Or experience of this in the workplace? Andy? I'm sorry to disappoint, but I don't have the answer to your question. What I did just want to jump in and say is, we won't have five minutes at the end of this. Um, and I think we're going to be called back quite soon. So if oh right, I, I got a sort of yeah. countdown. There was a countdown thing last time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, transporting you all back in one minute, Karen. You've got to go. <laughs> You're on. I, I'll speak when we're all together. You, yeah, no, that's fine. Oh, fine. Okay. I mean, it seemed to me the things that came out of that for me were um, that. Uh, we need that that it's with employers to employers that we need to communicate very importantly uh, that we need to keep repeating the point that many employers know that that people are their most valuable asset um, and that uh, we need to be clear what problem we're trying to solve so what are the what what are the issues in terms of adult education and lifelong learning that need to be addressed in facing this future and that I think very strongly from Richard, that there are good stories to tell. We mustn't make this sound like um, a, a nightmare. We need to make this sound like something to which people can contribute um, and be, as he said, very genuine, honest and truthful in how we communicate. So those were the messages that came out of this uh, for me. The key word in there is unknowable, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, so I think that we are we're trying to envisage something which um, is emergent and so the best that we can do is to work with I think what 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 is in the flow of the interests of people and the interests of people are rooted in their experiences at the moment uh, we can of course think about the future um, but in many ways, I think that it's really important to be giving people a chance to have a sense of agency over the future, rather than the future coming at them like a steam train and they just sort of end up getting flattened. Mm -hmm. So if I was to be thinking about what capabilities people might want or need, it's something to do with 
having a role in crafting that future so that it helps them to address the things that they're interested in and giving them a sense of meaning and purpose in their lives. Uh, if, if I could uh, come in on, on the back of that, I'm, I'm Chris Butcher, I'm the policy manager at the WEA. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Ruth's starting point. I wonder if it's something about having a, a culture of learning, making learning part of uh, everybody's everyday life and, and valuing that so that if, if the future of work is unknowable, let's face it, the future of everything is unknowable, what you need is a kind of basic level of uh, confidence, I guess, that, that, that you know, you're able to learn, that you have the tools to learn, that you know where to go for your learning, all of that kind of stuff. So, so if the kind of the infrastructure is there and, and the culture is there, then actually that could be applied to the workplace as easily as any other uh, situation. So I think that's, that's the starting point. And I guess just one final point on the culture thing, that then needs to go through every bit of every sector. And so going back to the introduction, you know, if employers don't also have that culture and don't value their employees' right to learn, then, you know, the whole thing will fall apart. So, so I think that's absolutely essential component as well. I mean, I think that the idea of um, inculcating in people some general capabilities for learning is really, really important. And having just said that the, the future is unknowable, and it surely is, uh, there are nonetheless clues in the present which I think can, can help us to craft and unfold that future in a way which is more inclusive and uh, can enable people to feel that they do have a sense of agency over it. So we, we are becoming aware, are we not, of the importance of the caring and the provisioning economy in a way that we've never been before. And um, this is actually, I think, a, a really strong clue to what we're going to need for all kinds of challenges that we're going to be facing in the future, including the sustainability ones. And I think if we were to come out of the current COVID-19 crisis with a, a real sense of, of needing to preserve and extend the caring and provisioning economies, we, we would be on the right track towards that future. And that might then help us to say something about the, the kind of learning that people might need in order to be able to navigate that future. Mm. I think, I was, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I think that this, what's really interesting as well is that, for example, the younger generation are currently seeing adults of all ages, all backgrounds, all life experiences now, many in a position of relearning, reframing, reviewing, revaluing, reassessing. And suddenly the idea of a culture of learning, to go back to what Chris was saying, is, is a very real thing. It's happening in the home, it's happening in everyday spaces in a way that it may have not done for a very long time. So it's a very special moment to also capture the fact that learning is life-wide. Most children at school do not consider beyond university there to be a life-wide aspect. And also that it, it, it transcends class and background, culture, location. Um, and I think that's something which is quite, it's situated now in front of people in a way that it may not have been for a very long time. And it's something which we can build from in an embodied way. Yeah, I'll quieten down. That's nice. Anybody else feeling? <laughs> if, 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 I, if I could come in here, um, uh, John Holford, I, I, was, uh, I was one of the secretaries of the Centenary Commission. Um, and I, I mean, I, I agree very much about the importance of, a, of developing a culture of learning. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's very, uh, you know, clearly the 
events of the last few weeks were not something which we remotely um, contemplated, uh, you know, at the time we were working on the Commission report last year. Um, that, uh, but ha having said that, I think I would take us back, take the conversation back a little to uh, what um, uh, Helen um, Helen Ghosh said in introducing this session about uh, the way in which we have come to re uh, to to value more highly now, and I, I mean this is a very strange we to, to uh, society has come to value more highly. Uh, um, uh, occupations, roles, tasks, which until, uh, which, well, which uh, progressively have been treated as not very important, e you know, in, in terms of uh, financial reward and so on. And even in the educational field, in, in uh, education, vocational education, whatever, we have in recent, the, the recent um, uh, fashion uh, has been to say that learning is important for high-tech jobs but is not really very important for ordinary caring professions they just they, 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 that is a lower uh, level of stuff and I think we need to to take us beyond that to see that you know that there is real social value in the or in and I put this in inverted commas in the ordinary occupations of life. You know, we see now that um, that people who uh, clean hospitals, who maintain care homes, and so forth and so on, are really tremendously important. Not to mention, you know, the people who who um, serve in shops and so on and so forth. These are the people who, in many ways, are keeping our societies ticking over. Um, and we need to we need to uh, bring that much to the fore. I see that Sharon has at last been able to join us. Yes, I'm so sorry about that. My computer crashed, and then it wouldn't let me back in. So, sincere apologies. It was great timing. That was. So, um, <laughs> are we discussing the key question then, John? I'm sure you're. Think, you're in. I think I think I think everyone has managed without you, Sharon. <laughs> it's embarrassing to say so, but I think we have. <laughs> no issue with that <laughs> uh, okay I've, I've just pasted some uh some notes into the chat box i've just tried to summarize what people have said as, the, as they've been going excellent if i can come back to the point that john's just made i mean um we've been talking very broadly i guess there are a few sort of specific things that we could potentially focus on so obviously before COVID-19 hit uh, the then newly elected government, only a few months ago, seems like an age ago, doesn't it, was talking in terms of the National Skills Fund, of the National Retraining Scheme, of a whole bunch of things around, uh, you know, basically training, learning, and so forth. Now, obviously, the landscape has completely changed, but one assumes they will come back at some stage to things like those schemes like those programs they're still you know lacking any detail and I guess if they're not recast in a kind of post pandemic uh, way and address some of the things that, that John for example has just been talking about uh, then there are huge missed opportunities so if we're talking about uh, you know a, a way of taking this forward in a campaigning way um, you know it could be that the government's agenda coming out of this crisis and the immediate kind of urgency around that uh you know needs to be needs to be looked at yeah i mean it's, it seems to me there's this all the whole of it needs to be set within uh, a framework and uh it needs to have a number of sort of jigsaw pieces which fit together into that framework and the kinds of jigsaw pieces which i think are relevant are things such as good work index so we know a lot about the nature of work and the quality of work and the nature of good work in the future is going to be the same as the nature of good work now. And we could do a great deal to specify the content of a good work index for the UK context. 
Uh, we could also think about that in relation to employee voice and uh, forms of ownership within organisations. And I think that a lot of this comes down to the question of power and the way in which we uh, think about the relationships within organisations and who has power and who doesn't, who gets to speak, who doesn't. And then how does that uh, play out within the roles uh, that we ask people to do within organisations? I wanted to throw a question in there to colleagues on this um, on this call who are from HE, and whether the 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 nature of adult community learning, whether REF and other modes of um, kind of claiming um, status or um, ensuring positions, um, where, where that doesn't apply, there might be naturally a more solidaristic approach to sharing learning, working together, working through mutual challenges, and whether therefore adult learning was a great space for a more progressive approach, which is a community and collective approach to, to developing these, these, these thoughts and channeling them where it's not going to be claimed or IP'd or put forward for um, promotion, job security, et cetera, et cetera. Just an open question to colleagues within HE um, if there are any responses. Well, um, to, to, to respond, if only because I do work in higher education, um, I mean, I, th I think that you're absolutely right that the um, the incapacity of uh, the, the, the decline or decay or uh, destruction of um, higher education provision uh, for uh, uh, people outside who aren't um, enrolled students of universities has been very damaging to uh, communities and society. Um, that uh, what I would what I would wrap that up with or link that to is something which to me has become very clear in this um, uh, in this uh, crisis, which is the that we we can't afford to rely on the um, uh, the foresight of uh, as it were um, our masters if I can put it that way you know um, I mean um, governments are you know for, for the, the governments have tried increasingly over you know the last over recent decades to uh, tell every bit of society actually what it should be doing and you know we know this in education we are told that you know these are the targets and these are the key performance indicators and this is what we should be doing and that's what we should be doing um and of course that that applies also to you know the, what they do in what is happens in education is equally true of other sectors um um hospitals and so on uh, and yet they've governments have profoundly got it wrong in 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 relation to the coronavirus um uh thing and um the breakout room is closing in 59 seconds so i shall have to forget to finish up quickly um yeah so i think we need we need to be able to we need a broader um substance of society to be able to um to be able to uh, ensure that there is resilience rather than just the ability to do certain things which are specified very well. And given the unknowable future, we need to have that resilience built into, into the educational system. And it needs to be built in at community level, I think, doesn't it? Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Um... Sorry, I think we're about to close down. Yeah, I think I think we've had we've had it now. Um, oh, this, this is this is a situation where we can't we can't influence the decision to close us in ten seconds. Well, it was very nice. <laughs> yes, indeed. Talk to you all. <laughs> nice, nice to see you all. My end. See how nice.
to see some faces in this room. It's quite exciting because you don't know who's going to come in. It's all up for chance. Hello everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining today and um, I have put the recording on and I hope you're all comfortable with that uh, as it's, it's simply for our purposes and and um, you know if anybody has any objection um, I think Andrew and the team at the college had already asked if you if you had any concerns so let's let's power ahead. Um, I think just we've got round about uh, 20 minutes if people, rather than us go around and introduce ourselves, if people could introduce when they make a point, um, that would be very helpful just so everybody knows who everybody is. And what I, my job is to try and, and capture no more than sort of three key bullet points out of this conversation. Um, and I will then feed that back to the wider group when we go back into what's the equivalent of a, a plenary uh, session I guess. So that's the question posed. It's a bit of a cumbersome question but it's, it gets to the heart of what we're trying to look at and what we tried to address uh, it, as one of the big elements in the report. How do we progress an adult education agenda which addresses the unknowable future of work and builds a campaign around it? And just briefly by introduction, um, the unknowable future of work was a phrase, I think Simon and I were visiting Jonathan in Oxford at the very beginning of this project and when we first sort of met up with you, Jonathan, and you used that term, the unknowable future of work. And I think it's a very powerful term uh, in, in, in light of what we're discussing today, but it's really stuck with me because it says to me that not only we need agility, we need incredible imagination and creativity, we can't carry on doing things in the way we've done because actually we're not really sure what's coming and I think our current experience very much demonstrates that. But how do we, you know, how do we go about bring, bringing adult education in to, to try and address that and, and, and how would we then you know, try and try and develop those ideas in a campaign. So the floor is open to you. If you kindly put your hand up when you've got a, a comment to make and that, that would be great. Who'd like to start? Hi, Zahid, nice to see you. Good afternoon, sir. I just want to clarify one thing on your question. By the term and word work, do we mean paid work? That's an absolutely fair question, and it's almost bullet point one. <laughs> what do others think? I mean, I, it, yes, I, yes, I think so, in the context of that question, would right. be my view. But it's a fair point. Any other observations or views? What sort of adult education are we going to need? Hi, Jonathan. Are you there? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can't yeah, sorry. see you. I was, I was struggling to unmute, but I seem to have unvideoed myself as well. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah, when I was just thinking that there was a, a good uh, question from Zahid, and um, I mean, it could be that that's, uh, that's one of the un other unknowables, or that is one of the unknowables. Um, the um, arguably one of the greatest uh, economists, John Maynard Keynes, who, who worked during the 1930s of uh, the Great Depression and, and wrote his famous book in 1936 on the general theory of employment, interest and money, um, arguing that, uh, that um, governments can tackle unemployment by uh, investing and so on. He also wrote a, a really interesting piece about what the world will look like for our grandchildren. And he assumed that by now we would only be doing you know, two or three days paid work because he predicted there would be product productivity increases over time, and so he and he assumed um, he assumed that uh, um, society would take the, uh, the benefit of that productivity growth by by spend, by being able to produce the same amount of goods and services in in less time and enjoying more leisure. And unfortunately, as we know, we've done the opposite. <laughs> we're, we're all working harder harder than ever, more and more stress, producing more and more stuff 
which is completely unsustainable to, to try and produce infinite amounts on a, on a finite planet. Um, so I think actually, um, Zahid questions that is a very good one and that, that one thing in the future, we will have to um, think differently about distributing, um, distributing work and, and uh, um, you know, valuing unpaid activities as well. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Could people just remember to introduce themselves when they start? That'd be great. Thank you. Hi there, Stuart. Hi, yeah, um, Stuart. As I, do you want, I'm, I, I mean, I work in the University of South Wales. I was just thinking also that there's so many people that are working unpaid in, in uh, parental roles or caring roles, and we need to think about how the education helps them to do that as well as doing whatever they might do at, at some future point when they're, they're no longer, you know, they might not longer have those responsibilities, keeping them in touch with the paid world of work, even if they're not actually able to do paid work or they're, they're, you know, a lot of their work isn't, isn't paid. So I'm thinking about adult education in that regard, I think is really important as well. So it's, it's a more prosaic point, but um, when, when I see a lot of our students who we are helping to get an education to move into a different part of their lives, whatever age that that's that's the, you know, the really critical thing is help them with their lives right now as well as their lives as they might be yeah so it's almost having skills that transfer across and and resonate d depending on different periods of paid and non-paid work but sorry i'm see somebody else put the hand up but but also that it that enriches things education enriches their lives right now as well you know not assuming that because your you, your job is is you know is, is is some form of manual work or whatever it might be that that you're not also able to to ex explore and enjoy the the you know the, the more aspirational parts of education thank you Stuart. it's a good point hi simon hi Phil. hi everyone i'm i'm simon parkinson i'm with the wea at the moment but was formerly with the the uh, co-op college as well so it's nice to see some familiar faces from both organizations actually so you know delighted to join you um i think uh, you know that, that opening about whether we mean paid work unpaid work whether it's it's how we use time that isn't leisure time is is really really interesting and for me if, if the future of work paid or unpaid is unknowable or is at least opaque then you're right if, if this conversation stays about skills then matching skills to future work, paid or unpaid, is quite difficult. But actually, if we also introduce the notion of how do we want to be with each other? What are the behaviours that you know get us through crises like we're, we're currently um, currently experiencing? And and there's that you know old-fashioned, and I mean that in the best sense of the word you know character and ethic and you know what role does that need to play in in adult education so that we're not getting dragged down a completely skills-based route that leads to paid employment as important as that is you know is it more rounded than that and actually does does our approach the way that we um, work with people work with our students seeing them as co-producers of knowledge does, does the whole ethos of that not need to to be brought to the fore rather than just a, a narrow skills-based approach thank you simon and, and and for those who have plowed their way through the report um of course that was very much an assumption that was held by those commissioners a hundred years ago quite a, a surprisingly um, mature, I think, uh, assumption about, you know, the value of other types of learning. That, that it, of course, there was the technical skills that one needed in order to work and make a livelihood, but there was the much wider understanding of what those other, those skills were for, whether that be, you know, the civic skills you might need to, to be in a democratic society through the enjoyment you would have being with people and learning things. So uh, it's wonderful to me that we are able to, in a sense, it feels a time of flourishing for some of these discussions again, doesn't it? So thank you, Simon, really good point. Anybody else would like to um, make an observation? Hi, David. You need, to unmute. you need to unmute, David. 
Could you introduce yourself as well, please, David? Thanks. I, I did. I did uh, <laughs> <to it. laughs> um, I've got a community cooperative and further education uh, background. I'm very happy uh, to be joining the conversation. Um, I'll repeat the point I made um, in the previous session, uh, that there are uh, legal policy and governance differences uh, across the four UK countries. Uh, and we've also got the added uh, dimension within England of moralities and uh, city regions and so on. So I think that's quite uh, important um, in understanding how best we can actually learn. Um, and there can be shared, um, if you like, approaches to experimenting. So I'm very much looking forward to the Scottish um, strategy, which I gather will come out in November of, uh, of, of this year. Uh, as a means of actually providing some leverage uh, for our own government in Wales uh, to take a much more serious uh, approach to properly funding um, adult community uh, learning, um, which um, I fear is going to be diminished as government builds more structures, creating a commission for education and, and research which will marginalise um, lay people and, and the involvement of trade unions. Thank you, David. Um, that's a useful point. Thank you very much. Any other observations? Hello, James. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, I'm James Robson. Um, I'm the Associate Director at SCOPE, that's the Centre for uh, Skills, Knowledge and Organisational Performance at Oxford University. Um, I, I just intrigued by, um, by by the phrase unknowable future of work. Um, it's a very elegant phrase, and I don't want to criticise you, Jonathan, for um, for emphasising it. But um, I mean, are we talking about an agenda which actually challenges the unknowable aspect and to make it more knowable? Are we talking about an agenda that actually just sort of acknowledges that we don't know anything about the future, and so then we try and deal with that unknowable? It seems to me that perhaps there's there's two parts of that and actually we can make the unknowable more knowable and so part of that agenda should be well what do we need to do what are the research strategies that we need to employ to actually look at sort of five-year um, projections of, of the future of work um, and then within that acknowledge that actually there's a whole issue of deterministic discourses that we need to challenge and we can't get bogged down into horrible phrases like computers or you know, robots are going to take over our, our, our jobs. Um, and so we need to work within the parameters of knowability while acknowledging some things are unknowable. And so that's a, my kind of reflection that perhaps we need to actually be more pragmatic and say, what can we know? And I think that's Keep going. You there, James? I don't think the robots like that very much. Oh, there he is back. Hi, James. We missed your last point there. Would you like? Would you like to remake it? Sorry, I probably was the last point or so. I think. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where where I stopped. Um, I think I was just saying that um, we need to, to, to really start thinking about what we can know um, and emphasise that that's particularly important in this COVID context um, where the future of work is likely to change or at least occupational identities are likely to change quite dramatically um, and start mapping those out while acknowledging that there is some unknowability but trying to find out what we can know and what research agendas and what research tools should be employed to do that. That's really helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Silla, you. can I just add to that and just referring back to the um, early 70s when Lucas, uh, Lucas Aerospace Combine Shop Stewards Committee came together and prepared a report which was about converting an arms industry into making, um, um, in making plows and, uh, and, 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 and socially useful uh, production. So I think that's quite an important aspect of creating the future that we want to see. Uh, rather than just accepting uh, the status quo or what is being driven by maximising uh, profit for capital. Thank you. Good point. Hello, Ben. Sorry, I've managed to unmute. <laughs> 
Yeah, another aspect of the, the unknowable future of work, of course, is that people often are insecure in their work. They don't know what their own future is going to be in work. So think about redundancy is often a time when people have to re-educate themselves and look for um, alternative alternative forms of work, alternative skills. I think that's something else that we need to uh, think about is, is that context in which people are, are looking for that education. It's not necessarily they're just, just looking to be to learn for the, the benefit of learning, but that they need to learn to, to re-skill. Thank you very much indeed. I'm mindful that we're heading to probably towards the last couple of minutes and there's a couple of people who haven't spoken. Don't want to put anyone on the spot, but if you if you do want to, I'm looking at top rows. Or you can't see your top rows. It's probably different to me. But are there any other any other comments, or would anybody like to make any concluding remarks? Simon. Oh, sorry. Do, does Heed want to go first? Because oh, I don't think he's he's made a comment yet. No, you happy to wait for you, Simon. Oh, thanks, Sahid. I was I was just thinking about the the sort of second part of the question and building a campaign around it, and it was something that both David and and Ben have, have said, is that to build a successful campaign, increasingly we're going to have to be aware of um, different place and different communities. So I don't see this as you know it, it's going to have different residences in in different in, you know places and for different communities. And also, particularly around automation of work, it's going to affect different regions and different sectors in in very, very different ways. So there's there's um, an inequality of outcome that is 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 going to happen through through automation of work potentially. And I think any campaign will need to recognise that you know it's 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 both place sensitive and and sector sensitive to have a a chance of of gaining momentum. I think. I agree and I, and I think um, perhaps one of the most significant things I've seen in my lifetime has been how space has become disassociated from work. You know, being a northern person, my landscape has been very much around work communities, you know, very visible ones like chimneys and canals and, you know, industrial revolution things. And that's all sort of un, un, untangled and unpacked. And it's, it's quite a, you know, in over a relatively short period of time. So thank you, Simon. Zahid, you'd like to conclude one minute. You've got the last word. Sorry, um, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm just a lay member, but I'm involved in the uh, WEA. Did the question I had about the question was, what is the role of education in society, not just adult education? And is it a role or is it a rule? Thank you. That is a very good place to end because I've got the call that I have to return to the main mm. session. So I'll press that button now and if people are patient, we'll go back in a couple of seconds, hopefully. Thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much indeed. Are we all back now, Chloe? I think we are, aren't we? We're all back. Great, well, um, I'm, I'm gonna ask everybody to, to to offer a couple of well, two or three bullet points but I would just remind colleagues on the call that there's been some extraordinarily rich chat going down on the column uh, side so don't forget to keep an eye on that and um, there's lots of advice and ideas and questions and provocations and we can always capture that I think and, and send that out if people would like that to happen but let me begin by um, asking our facilitators uh, to report back and although I'm room one and really should report back first if 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 people don't mind I'll introduce each of you just to give a, a minute or so um, to report back on what the sort of key points were from your session so if I could begin Helen your group two so would you be able to just say a little bit about what's happened in your group oh She's like, she's. <laughs> I can't hear her. Oh. No, can now. You can now. Sorry. I was just saying, but you can see me. I can't see myself at the moment, but uh, good. So we had um, three main conclusions. One was that um, if we're going to uh, get uh, the world to change, we need to start with communication with employers. We acknowledged that there were many great employers 
uh, as Roger said earlier, who understood the importance of uh, adult education and lifelong learning in the broadest sense, but still a number who didn't. So persuading employers as a main audience that the, um, of, of the importance uh, of our agenda was our number one point of three. Uh, the second was being able to define, making sure that we could understand and explain uh, what the problem was that we were trying to solve. What, what kind, what was the story that we could and should be telling uh, about the um, kinds of challenges and opportunities of the rise of the robot, but equally uh, the um, value that was increasingly being given to care and to broader skills about fle flexibility and dealing with change. And the third one um, was that we should be telling the positive stories. And we had a very positive story from one of our um, uh, uh, members of our group about um, the introduction of robotics into his workplace uh, and how actually it had brought forth creativity and flexibility among staff, uh, not the, 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 the high-tech computer uh, programmer uh, groups of staff, but broader groups of staff who responded incredibly positively. Uh, and the message there was that any communication should be honest and truthful um, and very genuine. Uh, so we needed to take the fear out of things. Thank you very much indeed, Helen. Um, could I invite Sharon Clancy, who facilitated group three, to feedback, please? Apologies, Silla, I had major technical problems, so I, I dipped out for about 10 minutes. So I think other people in the group might be better able to, to respond on that. Could um, you invite someone, Helen, from your, uh, sorry, uh, Sharon, from your yes. group? Yes, can I invite John Holford, because I think he was um, holding the conversation together. Uh, no, I, 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 you couldn't invite me, and I would accept. I wasn't holding the conversation together, and I wasn't taking notes. Um, however, from uh, Chris was, and so, so far as I can see, the the, the points that, that we can remain are firstly how we're becoming more and more aware of the caring uh, mm. economy and the. Um, the need to see the economy as uh, what matters in the economy is much wider than uh, just high tech stuff. Um, uh, second, secondly, um, the uh, the need to build a culture of learning uh, and the way in which that has uh, the, the way the way in which learning uh, under the the coronavirus period has changed people's uh, awareness of learning as or brought it brought learning as more of a more culturally centrally to the home perhaps uh, and thirdly uh, picking up on Helen's point at the beginning um, the uh, the way in which we have to um, re valorize if I can use a an over uh, the the importance of uh, of a whole range of occupations which we have tended to, to think of as less important, which society has tended to think of as less important, and which actually educators, not perhaps intentionally, but or not perhaps consciously, but unconsciously because of the way the system works, have given less priority to in adult learning. So it is, broadly speaking, high tech occupations which are seen as needing training and so on and not um, and not uh, those which are in in the sort of caring and more routine a areas of work we need to we need to work those through there was also a point I think about the importance of higher education uh, repositioning in, in itself in order to support this thank you very much uh, John thank you for those points uh, Melissa Right, well, I, I don't know that we came out with sort of uh, defined bullet points, but there were a lot of very interesting points made in the course of the discussion. I mean, I think the first was that the kind of society that will emerge in the future, that there are timeless skills that will always be needed and will definitely be needed in the future of work and society, like resilience, agility, and the ability to communicate, all the things 
that we're doing here, there was secondly quite an emphasis about learning going beyond, you know, courses and people at work being sent on courses to, uh, to, to learn some new skill, that actually the, the, there's learning that, go, that goes on in the workplace all the time and part of the future of adult learning is capturing what's going on in the work in the work environment and um and developing it uh, thirdly i think we looked a lot at what uh, what people have talked about already which is that the crisis that we're in now has brought a completely new focus and respect and value to a number of things one is caring for others and social solidarity and another member of the uh, group made the point about self-knowledge and personal development and that's also very important but finally the, just going back to the idea of robots that yes robots may well just an AI might destroy jobs but it will also free up a lot of humans who people who will want to who will want to be part of society and work in society and that might see the return and revalorization of kind of social caretaking jobs like you know think of the role of postman at the moment or i don't know about the rest of you but that milk men and i'm sure there are milk women you know people who are at the center of neighborhoods um and that was another thing people said that neighborhoods and local and and the local has become so important and we mustn't forget that and we must you know think about that in terms of future development there are a lot of different points made. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Melissa. That's, that's fantastic. And finally, uh, before mine is Tom. Hello, Tom. Okay, hello. Um, a lot of points made around, I think, the nat clustered around the, the nature of the employment contract. And perhaps I'd just say two things on that. One is, on the government side, on their agenda should be question of their their communication to employers to take responsibility to invest and and generally up the rate of um, workplace learning but for that to be complemented as it were by individual entitlement and that's particularly important in a context where people work for multiple employers and work is fragmenting and so on so both those sides of the employment contract uh, to be really stressed strongly uh, secondly, uh, picking up Karen Belmoria's point about adaptability, uh, obviously uh, a major challenge given economic changes and given the possible disappearance of whole sectors. But perhaps the sort of new thinking about that is, is, is how can we think about adaptability as a, uh, a team or a collective uh, skill as well as just equipping individuals to become more adaptable. So how do you allow teams to, to uh, develop uh, adaptability? And then I think thirdly, I just put in a different point um, about older people and how we interpret work. Uh, many more people now working in the formal sector beyond the age of 65 a lot of research and a lot of the data, ONS's own category stops at 65. And if we're thinking about the impact of um, technology on work, we should not forget uh, that there's a lot of people involved either in a formal sense or less formal sense uh, in employment and unpaid work who are a lot older than 65. Probably a few represented in this uh, particular seminar, I should think. Thank you very much indeed, Tom. So those were the three, the employment act, adaptability and older people. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. And I'm gonna be very brief because um, quite a lot of what we discussed has been covered. Um, we did spend quite a bit of time unpicking and reminding ourselves about different notions of work, paid and unpaid, and the relationship between adult education and, you know, that, uh, and it wasn't particularly explicit in the, in the question, but we acknowledge that, you know, work has changed so much that we need to do things very differently. We also need, need to do huge learning around being social beings, 
again, uh, in the, uh, and, and, and particularly at this time. Um, we are also unpicked the word unknowable. Uh, and, and one one colleague, uh, you know, said we 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 need to remind ourselves of what we can know, and get to grips with that, so that we make an adult education offer that is extremely, you know, relevant and meaningful to the crises in uh, in which we find ourselves. But then we also, and there were other great points, but I think also for the final point for me was we, we did actually try and get to the campaign part of the question as well. Uh, uh, and, and, and we did acknowledge that, you know, whatever we do, and I'm, I'm glad somebody else mentioned the importance of the local, but how, you know, anything we do in terms of campaigning is inevitably going to have a more local uh, focus and I think that's something that's coming over very strongly so that we have to be very aware now when we build this campaign of how it is going to resonate very differently because everything has changed uh, and, and you know it, that needs constant agility in our own thinking about what do we mean by a campaign and how do we get that going so um, you know just to conclude uh, I think really five great um, points back and if I if I may just ask Roger and Karen to just just spend maybe a minute or so responding to any anything out of either of any of those uh, points that you, you you'd you'd like to comment on. So Roger, would you be free there? <laughs> yes. Yeah, just um, real quick. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people are, are hoping that this whole kind of circumstances that we find ourselves in that there's going to be a kind of new settlement afterwards and that people are going to look at things um, a little bit differently well if that's the case I'm not convinced that's going to be the case but if it is the case and I genuinely you know truly hope that it is then I think that needs to be about investing in people um, and I think part of that investing in people has to be about um, learning um, not just to contribute to an economy in terms of what skills you may have, but learning because it's great to learn, you know, and, and it's just a great thing to do. And there's lots of opportunities. There's lots of people who've got some great ways of being able to help people to learn these kind of fantastic things that are around. And, um, but that requires people to invest in that. It requires people, um, not just employers, but it requires governments um, to invest in that as well. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that we are going to see things a little bit differently and that we are going to, um, you know, be able to inject some of the ideas that came out of the Commission's work um, into that debate. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Roger. Uh, Karen, have you a closing remark you'd like to make in response? Thank you very much. I, I found that uh, terrific in our session. We uh, and, and Roger, what you had to say as well. Uh, I was chairing a, a Cobra Beer board meeting today with my joint venture partners, Wilson Coors, and right through our priority is people first. And it's got to be people first. And it's companies that look after the employees because people will remember, employees will remember how their employers behaved at this time. Mm. And I think that is so important. And I couldn't agree more that this, the nurses, the care sector, all these people in the government's immigration rules have been categorized as low skilled. I mean, what rubbish is that? I mean, these are the people who are the champions of this country that we're all celebrating now. Um, uh, so I think that's really important. Uh, the points that came up about teaching employers, Employers also need to be taught. This is about workplace learning. It's not just employees, it's the employers themselves that need to, to learn as well. And I, and I couldn't agree more that this, why can't everyone have this attitude? How can we instill this attitude? Everyone wants to keep learning and it's gonna be to your benefit to be able to grow as an individual, but also to adapt to the changes that are gonna keep coming and keep coming. And people have many careers and it's that wanting to learn and that availability of learning. And I just close with, my favorite, one of my favorite sayings of Mahatma Gandhi, live as if you're going to die tomorrow, learn as if you're going to live forever. <laughs> That's perfect. Very good. <laughs> Thank Very you. Good. Thank you so much. And it's a, a, a wonderful thing to leave this with. Before I hand over to Helen to close things, it falls upon me to say thank yous. So thank you to all of the partner organizations and our speakers. 
uh, for this uh, webinar today and indeed to all of you for joining the session. There are still a few uh, remaining spaces on the next two webinars so uh, visit the Cooperative Colleges website and you'll be able to to um, join those if you haven't already done so. Um, the recording of today's session uh, will be available within the next week and will be sent to all partners to, distrib to distribute on their various channels, um, as well as appearing across the college's social media challenges and uh, channels and the YouTube channel in particular. And last week's recording uh, is now available on the college's YouTube channel uh, if you missed the session and you'd like to uh, to watch that again. Today's recordings will be sent to all attendees as well as anyone else who's expressed an interest in today's session but were unable to join. So um, we're doing this thing, we're making sure it all goes out there. <laughs> so we're determined that our impact is, is meaningful. Uh, and a personal thank you from me uh, to the Co Cooperative College team for making the technology work. Chloe, thanks so much for uh, being a lovely facilitator at that end yeah. and making it all work. So thank you. But Helen, if I may hand over to you um, for the last minute or so, thank you. Uh, no, 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 no. You need to unmute, Helen. <laughs> unmute you. I never know what you do remotely. So, um, a wonderful and inspiring session again. Um, as Jonathan, who's in on the call and knows, um, he and I have been inspired by last week's strong message about we've got to seize the moment. There really is a moment to be seized. Um, and the question is, you have to get the timing on these things right, but um, he and I have been, on behalf of the Commission, um, uh, working on um, a message to, um, well, the Secretary of State for Education, but I think the Prime Minister and the Chancellor too, saying, both reminding them of the lessons of the original Commission report, 1919, but 2019 in particular, um, but also drawing attention to the very points that people have been making today about the world has changed and the kinds of issues that have, we're all learning um, from COVID-19 make the issues of um, uh, the role that adult education and lifelong learning can play even, even more powerful. And if we are thinking, and rather like Roger, I'm hoping it's a different world. I have a slight, you know, cynicism that it might not be as different as we hope it will be. But if there is any kind of different world that we need to build, this is the role that uh, lifelong learning can play. So we will be reminding politicians about that from a commission point of view, but it requires, as every social change does, uh, action at every level in society. And it's great to have so many people involved in this discussion who can work in local communities, who have uh, networks that can help create the change we all want to see. So thank you very much for, for coming, for paying coming. Uh, part, and we look forward to seeing you at next week's session as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Helen. You. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to see you all.